I actually started off, believe it or not, I actually remember coming to your side, your neck of the woods, that country, I was coming all back and forth, and I remember I made for these cards. Tea. For a cup of tea. and all, oh, yeah, right. do love a cup of tea and a biscuit. And I remember, subhanAllah, I remember, I had these cards printed from Vista Print Online, and I had these cards printed with the hadith in the back and revive hijama, and I had the narration, and I was going out giving them out in shops everywhere I was walking around. I actually go to my friends in different areas of Birmingham and give out these cards, and I remember, because I was, I was, I was in a situation where I wasn't financially stable, I'd put like 10 cards per area, and I said, go to one shop, one shop, one shop, and I actually do that. So we're back for another podcast uh, with Punchline, and it's all about Mike, body and soul. First of all, I want to give my thanks to Knightsbridge solicitors in Birmingham for giving us their venue. Beautiful place, beautiful people, helping the community show your support. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce a new guest today. He's a local hero, uh, a man of many talents, and he's the founder of Lime Tree Clinic and Elite Performance Therapy. I just welcome Cam. So Cam, give us your introduction straight away. Uh, guys, absolute pleasure to be here with Punchline. Uh, looking forward to it to uh, give some insight to you guys, talk a bit about life in general. And the whole podcast scene is booming right about now, especially in Birmingham. You know, we're a bit behind London, but we're getting there. We're getting there. And it's time to inspire, inspire the mutes and bring something positive back into the community, I suppose, as they say. So for all the people watching now, yeah, who don't know what, what you do, tell us what you do, how it started. <sighs> well, the starting's, uh, the starting's amazing. The starting, I started from my garden shed, literally at my dad's house when I was young, about 12 years ago, I started off there. I don't think called, many people know it as hijama, as copying, but then I put a swing into it, but I brought elite performance, therapy, recovery, rehab. I brought a range of different therapies into one and I came out with therapy, which today is probably the biggest therapy used in the world by the biggest athletes, by the biggest names possibly. You talked about hijama copying. What exactly is it? What does it entail? Hijama copying basically is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallam. It's a sunnah. It's an act of the sunnah. It's a medicinal prophet, a prophetic medicine. It's a, from Dibu Nabwi. It's very strong, but it draws out stagnant blood, inflammatory build up debris around the body. Dead cells, protein, bacteria, certain things, certain, certain bits and bobs, so whatever, pain, for example. There's via trigger points to the body that help drain out all the inflammation. So it's like a detox, like a deep detox, but very good for pain relief. Pain relief, general anxiety, stress. So what made you start it? What, what was the passion behind? Well, it just kind of, it kind of just happened, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not, it's kind of just, it kind of just uh, I never, never in my life ever thought that I'd be like a sports therapist or I'd be working in this field or anything. I never had no idea at all. I was a normal young kid. So actual cupping, did you ever have a cupping session before you I had a cupping session, about? I had it done when I was about 14 years old on my shoulder. I had it done when yeah. I, was a, I, was, I was a young kid, but I didn't know nothing about the sun or what it was. And uh, after that, I, believe it or not, I started doing it just like that on people, just for the sake of like, oh, I heard this is good. But mind you, not knowing anatomy, physiology, not having an understanding of the human body, how the components work, it's, um, it's quite a deep thing. So when I started getting more into it, people doubted me. Everyone doubted me. Everyone said, you're crazy, what is this? I said, okay, brilliant, carry on. I'm sure you were one of my patients as well in my house at once, once upon a time. Yeah, I was uh, one of the beginning. You were one of the beginners, yeah. Me, was, my brother and my father. Yes, you would come to my house. Yeah, that, that was that was after the garden shed. So you had the garden shed, then you had the house. and then We you had, had revived then. We was... Yeah, it was revive, revive, yeah. revive, revive hijama. It was called revive hijama. That was the name. And I remember you gave us a complimentary key ring, which I still got. Oh, that's fine. With the hadith on the back of it. Yeah, and basically to encourage the message what it's about. Of course, to push something forward when you have a motive. I've always been a strong believer in anything I generally do. Whether it be cleaning the roads, whether it be driving a car, whether it be walking on the road, do it to the best of your ability, you know. There's no point doing something halfway, is there? If you're going to do it, do it fully, full capacity. Don't have no brakes, have, no, um, have no, um, no boundaries. You know, shoot for the moon. You can land a one star in it. Obviously, tell us about, there's a lot of people doing copying, yeah? Tell us qualifications, what should people have? Well, obviously, I did it first, but there wasn't many qualifications about it. Just knowing basic human rights, we used to do one sooner point, which is safe. Everyone's measured it, it's safe. General qualifications in terms of doing it, obviously you've got to have a grand understanding in science and anatomy and physiology. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to end up killing someone, which is common sense. There's actually a clinical diploma put in place by one of my teachers and a great friend, Dr. Ruzwan Suleiman from ICAT Clinic. Um, with him, he has the, the biggest qualification in Europe regarding cupping. And he's the founding face, face of cupping in the world at the moment in terms of like when, when, when the public health comes to speak to him, they speak to him, they don't speak to us, they speak to him. Alhamdulillah, and everyone goes through him and he's the main face of it in terms of knowledge, education. Because you, what you're doing, you're doing a first year medicine degree in what, in six months. So you're getting the grounded knowledge of physiology, anatomy. But naturally, as you grow with anything, you become better at a skill. So whatever you're undergoing or whatever you're doing, for example, if you're washing a car, over time, you're going to start washing it normal. It becomes second nature. With anything, it becomes second nature. And so like, from your experience, how long does the whole journey take to become competent in that particular field? Competence is everything. I know people who have qualified years ago and still not, they still can't put a cup on properly. You know, it's all down to uh, the person himself, self-confidence. Does it depend on kit as well? Uh, kit to a certain degree, I don't say kit. Well, yeah, you can't use like, everything's got to be, well, there's only one form of kit to be fair, but there's many forms of therapy. You've got the horns, you've got the dried, the bamboo, the wet, the flash cupping, there's so many different forms, but 
it all varies what you're starting and what you do and how you become. But what I do with the leap performance therapy, it's not more based upon, it's the cupping I push forward because it's sunnah, but you got more to it as well. We bring in a lot of the physio side of things, the rehab, the recovery, the performance. So it's, we've kind of changed the game a little bit. So it's not just cupping, it's, it's kind of swung over. It's like a full package. It's a full package, yeah. exactly. So if you're a player, you have an injury, you come to me, say, Cam, this is the situation, this is the injury I have, this is what I'm doing. I'll say, right, A, B, C, bring it down, diet, control, nutrition, physio, osteopathy, manipulations, bring everything in, BMI, body mass, because how we treat it is every patient has a different thing. Like if this bottle is a normal 50 CL and you've got a two litre, they're going to be different. I can't apply the same method to this, to the big one. So you've got to take a different approach to everything. So that's how so it works. proper tailor-made. Yeah, tailor-made, exactly. Custom to, 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 one, to one's needs. You know, the, uh, when you actually do a cupping session, would you say it's a bit psychology as well? So do you have any conversation with people? Oh yeah, I always talk to people to make them open them? up to you. Uh, yeah, for, generally as a therapist, I mean, first of all, in the dean, everything's in the manner. Whatever you talk about, it between two people, unless it's a podcast where it's open to the public. But generally when you speak to somebody, whether it's A, B and C, if A and B are talking, C has no business to know what A and B have spoke about, regardless, because it's in the manner, in the dean. So that comes first. Anyway, part of our grounded principles of how we brought up and how we grow up and how we live. And that manner is huck and you, you don't violate that. You kind of develop your build and then before you know it, you, you, whatever you talk about, it's between you two, but people, we talk about everything, life, work, family, issues, headache, lifestyle in general, business plans, ideas, inspiration, inspirational bits and bobs to help each other out. Somebody might have an idea where I can help them due to social media. I can help a lot of people, alhamdulillah, and I always do. I try my best to help as many as I can because when you give, you don't lose. So going back to the actual beginning when you started, you obviously started in your shed, you said. And then you moved up. How difficult was it to get off the bat and start something and get advertising, get people to know you? I actually started off, believe it or not, I actually remember coming to your side, your neck of the woods, that yeah. country, I was coming all back and forth. And I remember I made these cards. Tea. For a cup of tea. and all, That's yeah, right. do love a cup of tea and a biscuit. And I remember, subhanAllah, I remember I had these cards printed from Vistaprint online and had these cards printed with the hadith in the back and revive hijama and had the narration. And I was going out, giving them out in shops everywhere I was walking around. I'd actually go to my friends to different areas of Birmingham and give out these cards. And I remember because I was, I, was, I was in a situation where I wasn't financially stable, I'd put like 10 cards per area. And I said, I'd go into one shop, one shop, one shop. And I actually do that. Then it became word of mouth, kept someone doing it. And because I knew quite a lot of people anyway, because of the community, through friends, through friends, like through mutual friends. And then we kept coming, people started coming. Then I became known as the guy who was cupping because I was probably one of the first. So no one knew about it. And it was something new to the people. So it was, um, alhamdulillah, it was, uh, it was beneficial. And then I kept working. So for me, yeah, obviously the most powerful advertising is Word of mouth, like when people go to you, like for example, when I went to you, it was somebody told me to go to you, which is my brother. And then my dad wanted to come along because my brother said it. And then we went and shared it with other people. Word of mouth, 100%. And obviously, ultimately, it comes down to the customer service. Yeah, how you are with people. You have to and obviously, you make people. a lot of effort with every individual. You have to. That's eat. what I remember. Mm. And that's why I kept the key ring. Because I remember you said, look, I haven't got much to give you, but this is a gift from me. And just the thought of it obviously counts. How you treat people is how you get treated, right? In the more modern day, obviously, social media. Taking the game. So what do you do and what advice do you give young people to get their skills, their CV, their services out there? Social media is, is, is consistent of many things. Social media it can be used for good and bad, but whatever. So I've got two pages. I've got the Lime Tree Clinic, which is my main business, and I've got the Camgram, which is my personal one. And at first, my Lime Tree Clinic page was just a shambles of everything and everybody and it was just a mix of different topics. Then you probably notice now it's cleaned up purely for work-related. The shots come up, the shots come down. After that, nothing's been posted on there. I still do promos for people because it's got a big following on there, but I use the camgram as a more personal page because that's how it should be, separate business from pleasure. Or you can make both, but you got to be very smart with it because it can have a back backlash on you. Whatever product you got, believe in yourself and just go all out in it. Just post. I mean, if you look at my story, it's always, the, the circle's all spinning. Something's always been posted because I'm active on it. You have to be active daily. you got to be active. you got to be posting, posting, posting because, because believe it or not, people would, they seem to like, there's a lot of nosy people out there. You know, they're, they're always, everybody wants to know everyone, everyone wants to have, have a little mooch, not even with a cup of tea, just, just general, uh, <laughs> general mooch, you know what I mean? Just, um, Go in there and have a little mooch and just want to see what you're doing, you know. But each to their own, if that's what they're going to do. Our job is, the platform's there for us to promote and to promote our brand. Going back to um, sport and athletes and performance therapy, what kind of sports do you branch over? Like Football, I focus more on football. My niche is football. I've done UFC, I've done uh, boxers, I've worked a lot of, a lot of uh, heavyweight, heavyweight fighters and champions. Uh, I've done quite a bit, to be fair, but my main niche is football. That's the market that I've kind of, that's the kind of clientele that I work with, the football players, the athletes, the FA, the Premier League, the Liga. Uh, you know, World Cup. I remember a long time ago, I think USA Athletics team, juniors, came to Birmingham and they all had copying marks. Yeah, amazing. And they obviously, the American uh, College of Sports Science Medicine, ASCCM, whatever it's called, they believe in it big time. And they, they, it's just a, a rule in their athlete's book that they have to have a certain session of copying every so often. 
So that's when I first saw it hit the like the top elite the level. Main, uh, level of course. But I think people have do, been doing it for a while. It's just not evident. Michael Phelps has been doing it for the last 20 years. Michael Phelps. The swimmer, yeah? Yeah, and he's the best swimmer that's ever lived. And he's, every time you see him in the pool, he jump out and he loves copying him straight back in the pool. And he's the best <laughs> best athlete you'll ever see in the world. Michael Phelps is not a joke. The guy's a, a different level. You know, man, if it's good, good enough for him, it's good enough for Anthony Joshua, good enough for the Man U players, Premier League World Cup winners. If it's good enough for Man City, Madrid, Juve, you name any other team, I've probably patterned them off. Alhamdulillah, if it's good enough for them. I'm sure it's good enough for the normal A to B man, isn't it? So obviously you're saying the elite therapies for the big stars. Well, mm. it's not ideally for, it's not just the big stars. How would you recommend for youngsters, upcoming athletes to tap into that yeah. sort of therapy? It can be, it can be done, but it's, it's more of a, it's more of a one-to-one. So it's not, there's not really a, a set plateau for that therapy. Like I'm five foot seven, five foot six, five foot seven, someone's six foot two, six foot three. I can't apply the therapy on them. So every therapy has a different man- manuscript. You can't say that this therapy is going to be for someone. So it's all going to be done accordingly after consultation. So you sit the person down, you think, right, this is what I've got to do with him. Go over his list, go over his subject, go over what's wrong with him, what's not right, wrong with him. And you, you diagnose from there and you build from there. And you start a therapy, you start a performance kit from there and you keep building with that. And you're monitoring the games in between, how they're doing, what they're doing. It is time consuming, but it's part of what it is. Part of the role, yeah. Yeah, part of the role, hundred percent. You have to be there from. Let's uh, sway away from work at the moment. Tell us about you, not as a therapist, as an individual. What do you like doing? What do you get up to? Or do you have any time to do anything? I'm a family man. I'm a family man. You know, uh, I keep myself busy. I do have time. I see the see the friends and family, but I'm more of a businessman. I'm more of a businessman. I like to I like to look for opportunities. I like to I like to aim high. I try to I like to progress in whatever I do. I've got my hands in quite a few things. And I, try, I keep myself busy with them on the side when I've got time. I do a lot of travelling. I travel a lot, not only for work, but generally as well. I do a lot of travelling. So I just keep myself going, you know. There's been times I've, I've been sitting at home on a Friday night and I flew out to Paris at Friday after Fajr at 4 p.m., 4 a.m. and I've got back in Birmingham for Juma. People think you're crazy, but I do ultimately what makes me happy. It's just, it is what it is. You've got to do what makes you happy, right? You know, you can tell the whole world everything. They'll think you're crazy, what you're doing. And I remember that day, I never forget because the woman, she actually follows my Instagram. She checked me in, on, checked me on the flight and checked me back. She, when I come back, she goes, Have you missed the flight? I said, No. Nah. I said, I've been and gone. She going, you've been and gone. I've not even finished my shift yet. And I was laughing. I was like, look at that. But that's me. That's, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a very ecstatic character. I go with the flow. I have no filter. You know, I have no, no filter. <laughs> so obviously from a cultural point of view, I'm, I'm from an Asian Pakistani background. Yeah, same as me. You know? Do you find that family, friends and culture stops us doing things? Oh, 100% definitely. Do you want to be a footballer? They'll say, forget to be a doctor. What do you want to be a doctor for when you play football? It don't make sense. You know what I mean? But that's how it is. But I think our generation will support our kids. We were, used to the, we were used to the culture of parents coming home. I'll tell you what we used to. Coming home, eat your food, that means eat food for the English-speaking audience. Rotika, eat food, go upstairs, play on a computer, go to sleep, and wake up, go back to work. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. There, was, there, was, there was no was bonded. Strict there routine, was, yeah. Strict routine. There was no like, um, let's go football every Sunday morning. There was no like, uh, sit down and talk to dad about this, talk about that. The love was there, but we had an understanding due to culture. You know, there was a different understanding. It was a different level. It was 20 years ago, we're talking, 25 years ago, you know. I'm 31 now. I remember growing up as a kid and everything was just so systematically paced. We had good things to eat. We took amazing values from that. We took solid values. So I'm not going to, no way. I love my parents. I love the, the way I grew up because it made us who we are today. But it stopped, didn't stop a lot of opportunities. If somebody wanted to be a, be a footballer, they couldn't because they don't want to be a pharmacist or a lawyer. But they don't want to be a lawyer. They want to be a doctor. Or they don't want to be a footballer. So let them be what they want to be. Support them. But it was like, nah, you have to be a doctor. But then you're just not happy to be a doctor. So what happens then? <laughs> Become a patient. Become a patient. Literally, literally, mental health patient. Do what makes you happy, man. Okay, so do you believe that people of our culture or sort of a race or let's say <laughs> recently with the, the BLM issues going on, oh, yeah. Black Lives Matter, do you think we've got equal opportunities? I think we don't really care, to be fair. I think Asian people just go with the flow. Like, it is what it is. Because we've got such a big community network. I think Asian people just don't really, we're like, we've always been very tight. Like I speak to a lot of my black mates, a lot of my white mates, I say, you guys are very, very tight. I mean, I remember once upon a time, many years ago, I mean, um, with the whole system of how we used to like buy, buy a car or buy a property or something, everybody invest in, use the committee system and never really paid them back rather than going to a, a line of mortgage or a line of something else. And generally in weddings, if you needed to borrow money, your family were always there, cousins were always there, somebody was always there, you know. I think the Asian community is dying out now, mind you, you probably know it's dying out now. It's changing, now. nobody would even give you a penny now. They look at you like... You know, Times have changed. So. It's changed. But the Asian community, I don't think it affects us, to be fair. It probably does, but we're just so used to racism and so used to, you know, being stereotyped that we don't really care no more, I think, personally. I've never cared. I've been to the most racist parts of the world. And everyone said, you would be safe and not been sound as a pound. Probably the only guy in Switzerland with a beard walking around, around Montreal Lake and Evian Mountain and no one said nothing to me. Do you get their looks? No, nah, nothing at all. Nothing at like, all. So I'm, I'm, I'm a happy guy. I'm a happy go, I'm a happy go kind of guy, you know. You know, I just give a smile, receive a smile, give what it takes. Do you think it's based on interaction? 
It is definitely because sometimes, like you said, we're closed, we're in that closed well, circle. If you walk through, if you walk through a bloody airport and you've got a bloody gob on you or a face on you, people are gonna say, "What are you?" You know what I mean? But if you walk through, smile. How are you doing? You okay? How's things? You're right. Hand, hand a piece. Smile, gesture, smile, talk. Be normal. Be human for God's sake. You're nice. I don't have to worry about you. So, in the world, what's the worst place you travel to? It's political. It's a pl- very political issue, and people would know because I'm there every year. It's a very political issue, but I'm, I don't feel the blame to blaze, and I'll speak the truth. You know, it's uh, it's uh, Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. For me, it's Palestine. For many, it's Israel. For me, it's Jerusalem, and it's Palestine. You know, so I'm very direct. I have to be straightforward. I can't really um, hide it. You know, uh, so yeah. But alhamdulillah, I managed to go there every year, and you're restricted to the airport for ten hours, twenty hours, almost the whole day. You know, you can't get in because they don't want you to enter due to no really stupid questions, you know. And I've traveled all over the world, I've never had problems. But every time I seem to go to Masjid Aqsa, I want to try to go to Palestine. In Ramadan, I'm there for eight, nine hours, six hours, seven hours. I'm like, I'm not the only discrimination, one. yeah. Oh, you'll see, when you go to the airport, you'll see every single foreign traveler who is Asian or Muslim is pushed into a corner. For what reason? There's a special room for it. A reason. special room yeah. for him, definitely. I've you've, been there. You've probably been there yourself. But I enjoyed my time. No, I loved it. I, was, I loved it myself. Because oh, uh, 40 minutes into it, we were just cracking jokes. So exactly. We had a bunch laughing. of lads. A and they were just fed up with us and just let them in. You know, I understand they've got the issues, they've got the reasons, but you shouldn't drag the whole world into it, you know. If we've got issues with somebody and they wanted to come in, come, come into this room, we're not going to say no. You know, it don't matter, you know. And it's sad to see in this century, this time, that people have still got that mindset, you know. And especially coming from those who are the oppressors as well. And then trying to act like the victims, it just doesn't make sense. But that's a political issue for another day. You know, I'm not really a polit- man of polit- politics, a little, as I say. But maybe. Uh, I, you know, when you travel, you have like it's some mysterious experiences. One of the most uh, standout moments in my sort of experience was I went to Umrah not long ago with a bunch of friends. And uh, before we went, one of my friends said to me, in Medina, you're always going to have something that's going to be a standout moment for you. Uh, it's not like a factual thing, but for me, it's just how I feel that every time I've been there, there's something happened. So I've gone out to pray Fajr on the way back, gone into a pharmacy. So I think I got bit by a mosquito or something. I wanted to get some kind of uh, ointment or I think calamine lotion or something like that. Went into the pharmacy and a, a woman approaches me holding a baby and she, come, she seems to be either Bangladeshi or South Asian descent. I can't really confirm which one, but she's speaking Urdu and broken Urdu. So I knew she wasn't Pakistani. And she said to me, oh, can you help me out? And I said, uh, what do you need? And then the shopkeeper, the pharmacist, he was like, brother, don't help her. She's just going to beg from you. And I said to her, well, what's the problem? She goes, look, I've got a child. I need milk. So don't give me anything. Just buy me the milk. So I said, to her, okay, pick the milk up. And uh, I took it to the counter. And the, the guy at the counter was like, are you sure you want to pay for this? And I was like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll pay for it. And then she goes, I haven't got nappies either. So if you don't mind, can you get the nappies off? So I said, okay, then. Pick the nappies up, put it on the counter. Uh, I said, anything else? And she goes, no, that's it. That's enough. I go, you sure? Anything else? If you want to buy two boxes of milk, buy two boxes of milk. Because it wasn't that expensive, to be fair. Shopkeeper goes, okay, gave me the bill, paid the money. Went outside. She followed me out. She goes, brother, um, what's your name? And I said, why? She goes, I just, I just want to know your name. So one day I can tell the child that, look, ask this person. And pray for this person because they bought you milk. I said, nah, don't worry about it. I just want to be anonymous. It's done. I'm walking away. I said, before I go, what's the child's name? And she goes, his name's Abu Sufyan. And that's my name. <laughs> so it's really strange to meet another Abu Sufyan in them circumstances. A toddler who couldn't talk, but shared the same name. So even though we're so many worlds apart, yeah, we're so yeah. similar. Look, we got the same name. Yeah, yeah. And that story was my standout story. And for other people, it might be nothing. But for me, I really believe there's some... Of course, there's always in these special lands, there's all significant moments when you go to these holy lands... You're spiritually connected, you break away from reality, you're spiritually connected, you're, you're at the real cause, the right place at the right time for the right reason. So I believe definitely, of course, you everyone has significant moments. Mine was probably in Hajj. Mine was in Hajj when I, was, when I made Hajj in 2011. 2011, I made Hajj, alhamdulillah. And when I made Hajj, I, um, I was there and uh, when you come out from the Palatine of the Stones, the Jamarat, and there'd be a big rush, a hustle and bustle. And me and a fellow friend of mine, Mazar, his name was Maz, and we made friends with a local lad, and we made friends on the coach, and we became best of friends, really good friends to this day. We don't see each other much, but we still, when we do, we have a good catch up. So me and Maz were there, and it was water, subhanAllah, because it'd be so hot. But in the Jamarat, when you're in the stoning, the palting, everybody's rushing together. And then I'll never forget, because I'm a small guy, and uh, we went into a shop, and we were thirsty for water. We were dying for water, Allah Mabarak. The people be giving out, but there's thousands of people there. You can't, you know, you take one knock, you're gone. Shop was there, shop was getting raged by people running in. I'm a small guy. I've got underneath the, the thing, under, underneath a few people. As I got under, I've grabbed two bottles of water. 
subhanAllah, I've got two bottles of water. I've, I've pushed that through. I've paid. I think I paid extra because I just wanted the water and get out. Gave them the reals and I've made my way back out. As I got out, I've come, I've opened the bottle. I've put it in my mouth. And there was an elderly guy. He goes, brother, for the sake of Allah, I said, Bismillah, Rahim. I gave him the water. I said, maybe that might be my ticket to Jannah. I'm a sinner. Maybe that might be my ticket to Jannah. I gave him the water. Qadar Allah. My friend drank it. Yeah, he drank it. He goes, Cameron, it's half for you. So what was written for me was not the bottle that I purchased. What that was written for him. And what was written for me was to share with my brother Mazar the bottle of water. I'll never forget that time. So Allahu Akbar. Sometimes I think the little things, the oh, little they, details the that important thing. you reflect on it a long of time course, later. And it, it plays a vital lesson in your life, in your iman, in your belief in how you are as a person and how you fluctuate. We're far from perfect, but it's small things that allow us to grasp closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without even knowing. Iman fluctuates up and down like a yo-yo, but when Allah tests you with certain things, especially materialistic stuff, things that ultimately, why do people crave wealth? To feed themselves, right? Nutrition. Everything comes down to nutrition. Clothes you can go without, anything you can go without, but nutrition you can't go without. So when you test people by nutrition, food, hunger, what does Allah say? I'll test you. Hunger, wealth, loss of children, loss of wealth, everything else, I'll test you. So there's a test, and it depends. If Hadar snatched that bottle and said, no, 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 to an old man who's the age of my father, maybe that might be my ticket to heaven, to, to hell, rather than heaven. Or maybe Allah Musta'an might be my ticket to heaven, inshallah, which I hope so. I'm not relying on it. You continue to do goodness, but you, you seek where you can seek. Yeah, you bank that. You bank it, exactly, you bank it. The intention is the most important Alhamdulillah, thing. Alhamdulillah, you must con you must continue and, and keep going with the flow, but people don't realise this. People now, um, it's become a bit, there's a lot of these YouTube things, you've probably seen these YouTube things when they offer the poor people food. You must have seen these guys. It's become a gimmick. It's become a gimmick. Yeah. But at first, the guys who first did it were serious and you could see the reaction of the poor people who got nothing to offer, but yet they give the whole world. And the guys who are rich and loaded in suits, they're saying, get out of here, F this, F that, you know, saying stupid stuff and they're not willing to share their food, but the guys who got nothing, their hearts are big in it. Oh, I was going to say, like, uh, generally, principally on religion, they say that when you give it one hand, the other hand shouldn't know. So blowing up and doing this avatar, I understand sometimes you get a message out there and a build an awareness, which is great. Yes. But the best form of charity is private. Yeah. And even the person receiving it shouldn't really know where it's coming really from. Yeah. from. It should just be given and khalas done. It yeah. shouldn't be due for some people can say, oh, like, now we go to our masjid, it's become fashion. Oh, so and so sahab has given two hundred pounds for the mosque. It becomes a boast. Of course. Yeah. Then what is your, Then you've nullified that, haven't you? You nullified it so people can say, "Oh, he's look at him. He's such a big giver." You know, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It becomes the competition, for? and yeah, he's given, so I'll give. You ultimately lose the reward. So personally, each to their own, you know. But myself, just give for the sake of Allah and do what you can do for the sake of Allah and just try your best and go with the flow. You know, earlier we talked about your work. So let's say in ten years from now, things go to plan. What's your plan with your work? Inshallah, inshallah. Because I've always been a go with the flow kind of guy, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes. So I'll just leave it to Allah. I have plans, inshallah. But I think I'll do what I always do, just keep dropping them, keep just coming out with them and just keep keep pushing forth and just let nature take its course, inshallah. No rush, no rush. I'm very content with where I am in terms of whether I'm working with celebrities or whether I'm not working with celebrities. I'm very content where I am, alhamdulillah. Whether I'm working with my normal 8, 9 to 5 guy and whether I'm working with the guy who's earning a million pounds a week, it don't mean nothing to me. For me, it's about the passion of enjoying my craft and maximizing and helping as many people as I possibly can. Getting as many people as I can, especially the youngsters, trying to get them off the street, man. Try and get them off the street, try and get them into something positive, get them into something constructive. Get them away from any form of just madness, you know. Just keep them away from that and just try to find that balance. But we can only try, right? You know, uh, as a community or as a group of people, what can we do for, for the youth right now? Well, listen to them, befriend them and listen to them. Don't judge them. Befriend them and listen to them. That's my. That's what I do with all the youngsters. Befriend them. But how, how do? How can we do that effectively? Just, just show them love. Just show them love. They crave love, but they get it from the streets. The so-called friends, companions, they get it from them, and they all because they're all in the same situation. They end up becoming a big toxic bubble amongst each other. But when you're giving them that right love from experience, as we've been all over in our thirties now, you know. So in that age, we we know a lot more than they would know. So we can guide them the right way with love, but never rush it onto them. Never pressure them into anything. It's all done with, with love, with wisdom. Firm believer of wisdom, very important, very important. And let's say we have a, a young person who slipped up, done something that they shouldn't have done. How do we bring them back? Explain to them, we all make mistakes, haven't we all slipped up? Every single person on the line has slipped up, every single person. No one's got a clean sheet. Every, every son of Adam is a sinner. We all, we've all got issues. Everyone's got their battles. We might look all happy, as in, but everyone's got their internal battles. Everyone's got it. Okay, going back to some of the athletes you work with or stars you work with, Without naming or identifying anyone, what's been the most standout uh, results? What have you made somebody do that they never did before, before the therapy? Well, was there too many? No, 
Wow, there's so many months. Is, is there a measure that you do or what? how can you... I just let the results speak for themselves. And, you know, Alhamdulillah, there's been world champions, there's been World Cup winners, there's been Premier League winners, Champions League winners, Alhamdulillah. Also, I've seen uh, recently in some of your videos, you use a tool. The Graston, yes. It obviously does something special. In the body, under the, under the tissue, you've got a thing called fascia. Now, if you stretch your fascia, you stretch around the football tissue 10 times, that's how big it is. It's a connect, connection of webs and, and fibres under your body that helps your body manoeuvre and walk about and it, it allows your body to function. In your body, your fascia gets knotted up sometimes. This literally breaks down the fascia and the scar tissue that builds in your body. So it helps aid recovery. Helps aid recovery, especially range of motion. I use it a lot for ROM, range of motion. When someone can't move with a restriction, we break the scar tissue down, then we apply whatever therapy we need with that. And obviously, it looks painful. No, it's not. It's not it's very relaxing. No animals are harmed in this production. <laughs> Apart from the animals who have been treated. <laughs> yeah, the disclaimers out there. Disclaimer, yeah. In your um, sort of expertise, what's the most painful therapy? I think dry needling. And what does that do? It basically manipulates and helps stem the nerves. So if someone's got a twitch or a trigger in the hand, you can, you can do needling and it helps activate the nerves in the body. So I do use needling a lot as well. Needling, dry cupping. Uh, the fire cupping is very relaxing. You know, it's very good. The wet one obviously with the scratching, but the air goes numb. And for people who don't, or never had cupping or don't have an awareness of it, once they have their first sort of therapy, how often should they do it? Yeah, generally healthy, I would say once a year, twice a year is more than enough for any man. Any man is sufficient, alhamdulillah. But if you've got an issue, then obviously then you fall in the bracket of consultation where we've got a consultant and we've got a set of treatment plan up for you to build and to break around that and then we do come up with a, with a way. And obviously as and when injuries come about. Yeah, generally I think you know yourself. I mean, yours has been a good couple of years now, hasn't it? Since you've had it done. Mine, uh, yeah, quite so a long you time. You're quite You should get yourself down here, you know what it is? I know you're busy. No, and no, then, I've always got time. I've always got time. I make time for the people, man. I'm the kind of guy, I will come there for a half an hour therapy, but I'll talk to you for about two hours. That's brilliant stuff. Why not? Why not? It's good. It's nice to talk. It's nice to talk. It's nice to catch up. So generally, when we do this podcast, we ask the guests to give us the, the summary at the end, which could be one line, could be one word, word of advice, word of warning, whatever you want to say to put a conclusion to this particular conversation. Never give up on yourself and self-value. Now I'll let you like work that out. Never give up on yourself and self-value. That's all I can say. Now, if you don't give up on yourself, I can't go into it because only you know your battle, you know your war, you know what you're going through. Never give up on yourself and self-value. <laughs>